and she may be a colleague at our sister campus, but many of you may not realize that's just really a great stroke of luck for us here at Keene State because Robin has an extensive international reputation in open ed. And uh, her connections have brought her colleagues and collaborators in many countries throughout the world and literally every state in the U.S. Thousands of people in an enormous diversity of fields and areas of specialty follow her work. Some who are probably calling her online right now. Uh, she's had a profound influence on countless teachers, administrators, students, and others working in and for education at all levels. Indeed, Robin's own career trajectory is a testament to the power and potential of working in a learning Most of all, I don't think I know anyone as passionate and as dedicated to students and learning. She's always a teacher first, and always has students at the forefront of her thinking. She never misses an opportunity to praise her students, to consider their perspectives and their circumstances, and to show deep concern for them as human beings. Her drive to improve public higher education comes from this place first. <clears throat> These are the words that come up over and over again when others have described Robin and her work. Brilliant, engaging, passionate, generous, inspirational, transformative. And I will add that Robin DeRosa is a visionary. I was recently reminded when watching a movie about brilliant women that when we have a complex problem to solve, that we need to look for the genius among geniuses. Robin is that kind of genius. And while acknowledging that open is not a cure-all for everything that ails us in public education, she offers us a pathway and an opportunity <coughs> to consider how we can strive together as a community to revolutionize higher education. So I hope that we today can be open enough to listen with our minds and our hearts to do that work that is necessary. Now, I can say it. <laughs> to be very hard to follow. <laughs> I'm going to do what I can, um, but she, Keen State has gone overboard on the adjectives, but I'm good, I'm good. Um, I'm super happy to be here at Keen, which kind of feels like my second home. Um, it's been awesome working, especially with a bunch of your faculty over the last few months. I have to say, I did not fully anticipate this particular demographic. Um, having all these students here today. So I'm going to try to adjust a little as we go so that this is a little bit more oriented towards what you guys might be interested in. Um, but in many ways, this is about the experience of being in a classroom as a student and how we might rethink what that looks like. So I'll be super excited to hear from you guys at the end of this talk with the questions that you have and ideas that you have. Um, and I believe that we're tweeting right on the KS collab, so KSC lab hashtag. So if you are on your phones, I'm not going to be offended. I'll be excited because I know you're talking about me, right? Um, so we're going to talk about putting the public back in public higher ed. Uh, and I really want to talk about a thing called open education and talk a little bit about how that could offer Keene State a path forward in an interesting era for public higher education. And I want to think about what are the kinds of things that we could do for Keen State if we looked at an open education uh, sort of vision for our campus. So first of all, we're looking at driving down the overall cost of college for students. Making college more affordable is sort of the number one entry point into the stuff that I'm talking about today. Uh, but also improve what we call throughputs and student success. Throughputs is basically like, did you make it through the course? And there's different ways to measure that. Did you withdraw? Did you drop out? Did you fail? Um, but also, what kind of a grade did you get? So we're going to talk about how we can improve the statistics for getting students through their courses. Why does it matter if you get through a course, besides no one really wants to fail? What happens if you don't get through the course? It extends your time to graduation, right? And what is that all about? Is it like, some of you probably like college. You'd be happy to stay here for millions of years. Why don't you want to stay for millions of years? You can't afford it, right? It's too much money. So the more we put off graduation and push that back, the more money you guys have to spend, the least likely you are to make it, right? Um, that's what our data shows. So what can we do to improve the success that you have in your courses so you can keep moving towards graduation? How can we get you more engaged in your courses, right? We always talk about student engagement. What are some actual real ways 
that we can improve student engagement in their classes. How can we connect you with students uh, in other universities, with scholars in your fields, with people who work in the professions that you want to enter? What are the ways that we can connect our classrooms with the broader world outside? How can we make our faculty excited about teaching? Now I know all 100% of your faculty are excited about teaching, right? Some students are like this. Um, yeah, the ones in this room are, right? Um, there's, there's, some things happen to faculty. One thing is that we get old, right? And that happened to me. I, I, all of a sudden one day I was like, God, I've been doing this for a long time and now I'm old and I'm tired. Um, one question I have is, what do faculty need to stay invigorated and thrilled with their courses, especially when you know the stuff backwards and forwards and you've taught it 400 times, right? How can we get our faculty to be passionate um, and excited about work that maybe is not new to them or fresh to them in the same way that it is to students? How do we build collaboratives with other public colleges and universities instead of competing with each other? How can we build networks uh, where we can care and work together um, on the project of public higher ed. And finally, how can we build a case for public funding of higher education? New Hampshire has the great honor uh, of being one of the worst funded systems in the United States of America. So that's something very special uh, that we get to work on in this state. We need to improve uh, the taxpayer commitment to higher education and the legislative commitment because every time the state pays less money to higher ed, student tuition is what fills in that gap, right? So what I'm gonna to propose today is that open education gives us a way of dealing with all of these things at one time, which seems um, a little bit too good to be true. Uh, but let's start with the stuff that some people in this room are already well aware of, which is textbook costs. Um, textbook costs are uh, the red line there going up, and you'll see the overall consumer price index on the bottom. What that really shows us is that textbook costs are rising much faster, right? It's a little bit like the rate of, um, of healthcare costs. Uh, they are astronomically rising, and it depends what metrics you use, but somewhere between like 800 and 1,000 percent. Um, over the last decade or so. So they're rising uh, very, very quickly, and this is absolutely affecting students, as you know. 56% uh, of students, so more than half of students, are paying more than 300 bucks a semester for textbooks. And 20% of you guys are paying more than 500 bucks. Sometimes you go in the bookstore and you get one book. What's the most expensive textbook you've ever bought? What was it? This is actually, this is the interactive part of where maybe you're all just tweeting it, but what do you got? $250 for a single book. What do you got? $350 for a handbook. For a handbook. It's a travesty. Um, so when I say, you know, sometimes students pay more than $300 per semester, some students are like, I paid more than $300 for one book, right? Um, you tell faculty this, I'm like, that all faculty care, right? We want our students to have affordable materials. But we don't always understand what this means for students, especially students uh, who are dealing with economic challenges. Um, studies show, and actually this was a study that was conducted by a college bookstore um, of thousands of students, and they show that students worry more about textbook costs than they worried about paying for tuition. And the reason probably is that your tuition, you have a plan, right? Might be a bad plan but you have a plan, and the plan is student loans, your parents are helping, you know, whatever you've put together, those tuition bills are things that you've somewhat planned for, you somewhat expect. You walk into the bookstore and you get hit with that bill and you gotta take cash somehow out of your pocket and you don't necessarily have a plan for it. So either you pay for it on the spot or you do what lots of students do and you wait until you have the cash, right? And you're not able to buy those textbooks um, right away. So what we're finding is that because textbooks are so expensive, they are having a real effect on what we sometimes in the field collectively call student success. Your ability to do well in your classes is being directly challenged by textbook costs. When I saw this data, that's when I as a faculty member sort of woke up out of my stupor a little bit because this really shocked me. And quite honestly, I can't say I cared that much about textbook costs before I saw this data. 
67% of students reported in this study of 22,000 undergraduate students, 67% re uh, reported that they did not buy a required textbook because it was too expensive. So that's a ton of students. And if you're a faculty member in here, there's not a single faculty member here who hasn't had the experience of teaching with at least one student in the class who didn't have the book because they couldn't afford it. 38% in that study reported earning a poor grade because of their lack of textbook. 20% attributed a course failure to their inability to afford the textbook. 48% of students reported occasionally or frequently taking fewer classes because they couldn't afford the books. So again, when you take fewer classes, graduation gets pushed back. The further graduation gets pushed back, the less likely you are to make it there, right? So this is a big, big deal that students are taking less courses. Universities also don't like it when you guys take less courses. Why is that? Less money, that's right, right? You pay by the credit. When you take fewer credits, universities get less revenue. So actually, everybody collectively loses in this amazing paradigm, right? 26% of students dropped a course and 21% withdrew from a course because they could not afford uh, the, the course textbooks. Um, this, I think, sometimes wakes faculty members up a little bit when we see what that data actually looks like. And here's the thing, right now, today, at this moment, we're just gonna fix this and be done with it and move on to the interesting part of the lecture, okay? Because we can solve this problem right now by using what we call OER, Open <coughs> Educational Resources. So OER is basically um, people, scholars in the field, right? People like myself who are professors with PhDs and expertise, they write textbooks that they then openly license. So I might write a textbook and I copyright it to myself, that's great. But in addition, I add onto it one of these Creative Commons licenses. And what the Creative Commons license allows is if I copyright something and you want to use it, it means you have to call me up on the phone basically and say, can I use that? And I say, sure you can, it's $42. And you're like, great, right, you pay for it. But if I put a Creative Commons license on it, what that means is that I say, it's mine, but you can use it. And here are the multiple ways that you can use it. You can use it this way, that way, not that way, right? I get to pick, exactly. So people have gone out and they've written textbooks and openly licensed them and put them online. And what that means is that you can use them for free. You might not like to use something online, so you can print it out and bind it like a regular book so it looks exactly like a traditional textbook and that costs about $24. So suddenly your chemistry textbook that was $350 is $24 or free, depending on how you want to write it, uh, how you want to read it. So these books already exist. They are written by scholars and experts. They are peer reviewed. Then they have been used by students and faculty and continually rated as the same or better quality than the traditional textbooks that they replace. If you are a student, the first thing out of your mouth in your next class should be, hello, professor, why are you not using an open textbook? Did you review the open textbooks? Are you, have you heard of this thing called OER? And mostly you know what your faculty will say? I've never heard of that before. So you'll have to tell them, right, to, to go and look. This is a new field that's just emerging. But there are books in almost all of the big standard fields when you take Bio 101 or whatever. These books already exist and we can immediately solve the textbook uh, crisis really tomorrow if faculty are willing to convert to open educational resources. It doesn't work as well when you get high up, right, in those advanced courses with quirky things, right? We don't have open textbooks for everything yet. But for all of the main stuff, they're there and they're ready to go. Um, let's look at some of the ways, now we've got lots of data uh, since about 2012 when the data started getting produced. This is a lot of years of data now on how these things work in classes. So um, here is a study from 2016 that looked at all the studies that have been done on OER across um, you know, multiple platforms. And they found that students who use OER perform significantly better on the course throughput rate than their peers who use traditional textbooks in both face-to-face -face and online courses. Um, the course throughput rate is, a, is a, an aggregate, a, a collection uh, of drop rates, withdrawal rates, and see or better rates. So fewer students withdrew, fewer students dropped, and more students got better than a C when they used OER. 
Part of the reason why students do better when you use OER textbooks is what? What do you think? This is the response. They actually have the book. They have the book. They have the book from the first day, right? There's no one's like, oh, soon I have to wait for my check, right? Last month I have to wait for my check, and I'm always like, oh, in those two weeks, you slipped behind everybody else, right? So in these uh, scenarios, students are doing better. Tidewater Community College uh, actually started rolling out whole degree programs. So what they said is if you come here and you major in biology, you will never buy a textbook. And they're called Z degrees. Z stands for zero. Zero dollar textbook program. And what Tidewater did that was really um, awesome is that they collected data on their Z degree programs compared to the traditional programs that were still using high cost textbooks. In addition, when they first rolled it out, they took OER sections of classes and traditional sections of classes in the same field covering the same learning outcomes. Um, and they started finding not only improvements with their retention and withdrawal rates, but they also started asking students and faculty, tell us about your experience using the open educational resources. And here's a little graph you can see uh, that uh, students in this particular year's study, this is the 2015, rated um, the materials the same or the bottom one there is better than the traditional textbooks that they were using um, before. But it gets even weirder, and this is where I get excited. Because first I should tell you I'm an early Americanist. This is like Ameri American literature, 1400 to 1800. That's my field. I never even used a textbook. And now I travel all around the world talking about textbooks. Like, who cares? I don't care that much. I want you guys to be able to afford your education, so I care about that. <laughs> Textbooks don't really fire me up that much. This is where I start getting fired up. So what they found when they started polling people at Tidewater Community College about those courses that used open textbooks is the students said, not only is a textbook better, a whole course is better. So this is them rating the courses, not the books. And that's where I got confused, because I was like, why would, why would it matter just because you're using an openly licensed textbook why would the whole course get better? And listen, look at this student's narrative here. The classes with traditional published textbooks, I study and memorize the passive test. In this class, I have a greater appreciation for the things I learned because I actually experienced the material and lesson, as opposed to simply passing a test. This knowledge will last a lifetime. And I was just confused, right? Because I was like, why? Why would you say this? Where did that come from? And so I started thinking not so much about OER and open textbooks and saving money, but about the part of teaching and learning that gets affected by these textbooks. We call that pedagogy. If you think about, I teach uh, American Lit, so there's content, right? I might teach Christopher Columbus, for example, that's my content. But there's also how I teach, right? So you know you have some professors that stand at the podium and they read, from a thing and lecture, and you're just supposed to write down everything they say and then regurgitate it back to them at the end of the semester. And then there's other professors where it's all discussion, right? That's pedagogy. That's the how of how we teach. It seemed to me that something was going on here with pedagogy, that pedagogy, the how we teach, was changing when we started using these open textbooks. And that's what I really work on. I work on what are the pedagogical shifts that happen when we use open textbooks. I'm gonna tell you what happened with me and some Plymouth State students when I first started doing this. So I had a book that I used to order for class. It was called the Heath Anthology of American Literature. Has anyone here ever purchased a Norton Anthology or a Heath Anthology, Bedford St. Martin's? Okay, so a chunk of you. These are those, you know, I don't know, like 90 bucks, wafer thin pages, they weigh a ton, right? Students don't generally love them. But anyway, all of the literature in my collection for the Heath Anthology was published between, you know, roughly 1450 and 1850. So if you know anything about copyright law, does anything, anybody know what's weird and interesting about literature from that time period? <laughs> Something really interesting about copyright. It's public domain. What that means is that this stuff's old enough that for the most part, the copyrights expired on a lot of that, those texts. So you guys are effectively paying $90 to get a bunch of stuff that's free, right? That should be free. So all of a sudden I thought, oh, I wonder if I could find free versions of this stuff and not have my students pay all this money. 
So I made this um, little spreadsheet and I put it on Facebook and I said to the people in my Facebook group for the English department, hey, does any, anybody want to work with me? We're going to try to find free versions of this stuff so we don't have to pay any money. A bunch of students stepped up and over the summer, we built an electronic version, a replacement for the Heath Anthology of American Literature, filled with public domain literature that the students and I collected over the course of that summer. There's a whole story to how that happened, but I'm not gonna, not gonna bore you with it, to, except to say it wasn't that hard. It really wasn't that hard. We had to learn a few things, we had to do a few things. We, we built it. And in the fall, some of those very students who helped me build it were in my class, Currents in American Literature One. And off we go with this new book. And the students at first are so, I'm like a hero, right? I'm so heroic because our course is free, right? The students are so excited. Then they start using this thing and they are not happy anymore, right? Because the, one of the first things we read is Cabeza de Vaca. Uh, he's a Spaniard who explores sort of around uh, Florida um, way before the pilgrims. And the first thing that happens is my students are like, I uh, thought the pilgrims were first, right? That's already really problematic. Um, they want to know, like, when you read something in a, in a text and you know it's going to be a little bit different, a little bit complicated, the first thing you do is you read that little cheat part at the beginning, right? The intro that tells you what you're supposed to be learning, right? And you're looking at the footnotes. And my book didn't have any of that. All it had was the original text of Cabeza de Vaca, and the students were freaked out, right? <laughs> so pretty quickly, the book started to implode a little bit because it didn't have all the stuff the publishers had put into the Heath Anthology. So it seemed to me we could maybe make that stuff ourselves. So students were already doing research projects, right? They started writing research projects, and we dumped them into the book. So what would happen is, we're, before we got to the Pueblo Revolt, uh, Justin and Simon here went out and researched the Pueblo Revolt and wrote a little intro to it. I stuck it in the book just about a week before the rest of the students got there. And then when we all got there, people were happy because now they had a little gloss. They went out and they found public domain images. Um, and we had a pretty good textbook at that point. The students were excited. But another crazy thing happened. Think about all the work that you guys have done that you then stick into Canvas, or you type up and you give to your professor, and your professor's like, oh, you can pick this up at my office door later, you know, and nobody picks it up, right? This is what we call in the field disposable assignments. You stick it in Canvas, your professor grades it, at the end of the semester, where does that go? I'm asking you an authentic question. Where does that go? Yeah, I don't, I, I literally don't know. It goes like into the ether trash bin of the internet, right? It goes away, it gets deleted. Um, all of that stuff is just gone. Do you care? No, because no one ever wrote anything that amazing in your canvas, right? You're just like, I gotta do a canvas post tonight, right? Um, all this just goes away. <laughs> uh, and, and some of you write brilliant canvas posts. So I, you know I'm being facetious here a little bit. But this idea that in general, the student work that you're producing you know, it's for your professor, and after that, who really cares, right? So the students started realizing they kind of cared about this. Why? Because the whole class was going to use it as their textbook, and you know what? The next class was going to use it, and you know what? Students all over the country use this book now, right? So Justin and Simon have actually written for a textbook, like authentically speaking. This book has just been funded by the Hewlett Foundation. So these students are serious authors at this point of a serious textbook. Um, what we realized is that the book was starting to be way better than the Heath Anthology because of the way it was animating the students. And then we started doing all sorts of cool stuff in the book, right? This guy, Jonathan, likes to make these little videos, right? So um, this is him writing one about, uh, making a video about the Haitian Revolution and Toussaint Louverture. So he, he does these weird, like, edit things. The question is, like, what do you do, right? What's your thing? Do you make artwork? Can you make a map? Are you a graphic designer, right? Can you find some hyperlinks? What, what's the thing you could bring into our book? And now the book started getting really exciting because students were producing work that they knew was going to be used by other students in the future. This was a project that really mattered uh, beyond the class. I started putting all sorts of other cool stuff in the book. This is a little app called Hypothesis. And what this allows you to do is as you're reading the book, you can highlight and put notes in the sidebar. But your friends can see the notes. 
So students were, you know, reading about Christopher Columbus and sort of, um, sort of chatting with each other in the margin about the reading. You know how normally if you're reading big chunks of text, you're highlighting, you're writing notes, but it's, it's not social, right? It's not overly interactive. So the reading experience in the course became really fun, right? When we were annotating Freud in another class, um, it got, well, a little off color sometimes. Um, so all sorts of cool things emerged, and I realized that this textbook offered us so much more than the Heath Anthology of American Literature ever had. Uh, the fact that it was interactive, right? The fact that it was alive, that it could grow. The fact that if something in current events happened, for example, um, think about all the stuff going on with the pipeline issue. And here we are studying Native American oral history and reading some sacred texts about water in that early section of our course. Could we, for example, drop in some blog posts related to the Dakota Pipeline, right? And make a whole current events section. You can keep this textbook fresh and moving all the time with students contributing in interesting ways. So I started thinking that what we really have here is not just OER or cheap textbooks or free books. We've got a whole way of thinking about teaching and learning in a new sense. And this is what we call open pedagogy. And it spins around three primary uh, targets. Sometimes when I give this talk, I have four. Sometimes I have five. It just depends on my mood. Today, I have three. Um, and the first is that we're going to improve access to higher education. We're going to make it more affordable, and we're going to make it more accessible to all different kinds of learners. The second is that we're going to stress community and collaboration over content. And the third is that we're going to connect our college to the wider public. So I'm going to talk about how we do each of these three things in the way that we talk about teaching and learning. So first, access. In general, when people talk about OER, they talk about textbook costs. That's it, right? Bring down textbook costs. But it seems to me if you want to save money for students in textbooks, then you're talking about something larger, which is that you want your students to be able to afford to go to college, afford the real cost of college. So what this is about is not just textbook costs, but asking questions all the time about what students need in order to learn and what they can afford. One of the things that's a little interesting, think about it this way, I say, you know what, your textbook is now free, it's amazing. Please take out your $900 laptop and let's access your textbook, right? Suddenly, it really matters whether you have a device or not. So one of the things we had to do at Plymouth State is when we were gonna switch to OER in my class, I had to make sure that our library had a laptop checkout program so that every student could be there live with a laptop, right? What are the issues? We call this sometimes the digital divide. Um, what it means is that uh, your access to technology, both the skills and literacies, but also the hardware, you can't just start these programs and do them and not ask those questions, right? Um, you, have to, you have to make sure that when you find what the barriers are for your students, um, you are bringing those uh, up and trying to solve them. Uh, digital redlining is a similar thing. It's the idea that uh, some policies that we enact while trying to bring technology to the masses could actually make things worse. Um, they could actually disenfranchise some students. One of the things I think about is like uh, access to Wi-Fi and internet. So for a lot of the, us, we take this for granted. But if you're taking a course that a lot of it is connected and online, but you don't have internet in your home, for example, maybe you live in a rural community, or your parents can't afford it, or you're living on your own for the first time, you have to go to the library every time you want to access your course, right? These things can be real challenges. Um, also, what are the issues in working out on the open web? Probably pretty much okay if you're going to be blogging as a guy was working with at UNH recently, and he's uh, blogging about sort of math algorithms with his class. Great. But suddenly, I'm teaching a composition class, and my student is uh, blogging about coming out of the closet for the first time and how that feels as a first year in college, a first year student in college. That's going to bring some interesting comments to her blog. Are we working with our students, particularly women and students of color, to talk with them about what it means to be out on the open net and what kinds of safety uh, and privacy issues exist when we're, when we're starting to work in larger communities for the first time, right? Canvas may be uh, a little stale, but it's also safe in some ways, right? So what happens when we start working in more public ways? So I want to think about access 
and fairness and justice in broader terms than just saving money on textbooks uh, in part of this movement. This is an interesting one. This is where sometimes your faculty are not as happy with me uh, about it because faculty have this thing, right? Like, I teach these 17 things in this intro physics class, and no matter what, I have to teach these 17 things. As if there's 17 things in physics, right? I mean, how many things are there in physics? This is an authentic question. How many things are there in physics? Too many. Yeah. <laughs> that was fun. Um, I, you could almost say infinite number of things, right? There, there are so many things in every field that faculty are constantly making choices about what things to cover and what things not to cover. One of the things I suggest is that content alone, the number of things you cover in your class, can only be a small part of what we teach you guys to do. The other thing you have to do is you have to learn how to learn in that field. For example, let's say I'm a med student, and I'm gonna do, my husband's having knee surgery. Hi, honey, if you're watching, I'm on your He's having knee surgery next week. So I think about it this way, right? You're, you're gonna be a, um, what, what is the word, osteo, ortho, orthopedic surgeon. You're gonna be an orthopedic surgeon. You learn a bunch of things in graduate school, it's really important, right? And then you graduate. And now, 20 years later, do you wanna be performing knee surgery exactly the same way as you did when you first graduated? Who way, right? What that means is that we expect our doctors to stay current in their fields after graduation. Do your professors teach you how to do that in your field? Or do they just teach you the bits and content that they think matters right then? So my suggestion is let's move more towards networked learning, hooking you up with the fields so that you can keep learning past the end date of your course. We think of that as what I call um, rhizomatic learning. It comes from a guy named Dave Cormier, who's uh, really interesting thinking about this. A rhizome is like a root system, right? Oh, did I just click it? Oh my gosh, I clicked it one away, there it is. Um, it's like a tangly root system, right? So the idea is instead of a course with a beginning and an end, we think about a tangle of roots. Um, we think about rivers where content is constantly flowing, and you guys have to start learning how to pick out the stuff that matters. Um, can we maybe de-emphasize the content a little bit and emphasize more hooking you up with your communities of learning? I think a lot of faculty would say yes, but they don't know how to do it, right? But we can teach them how to do it. It's actually a thing, a, a set of teachable skills to help students learn how to connect with their uh, scholarly communities of practice. Um, and also, you hear these terms on the right side probably all the time. Faculty for sure, right? You hear this all the time. If you go to the Keene State website right now, I guarantee we can find some of those words really close to the surface, right? The idea in education is that we want you guys working, right? Real world stuff, applied, experiential, right? We don't just do book learning here at Keene State. Um, but really, do we do that? Do we know how to do that? Okay, so maybe you have one internship. Maybe one time some professor took you on a field trip, right? It was exciting. What could we do to really mean these things and do them almost every day in class? And I think the idea here is moving away from the language of like students are at the center of what we do and really saying if students are at the center of what we do, prove it. So like, if you're in a class where you get to talk, does that mean you're at the center? Is that student-centered learning just because someone let you talk when you had something to say, right? I'm more interested in, can students, for example, help set the syllabus? Can they help generate learning outcomes? Uh, can they help decide which text to read? Can they help decide how we're going to do our assessments? Uh, can they help set course policy? What, what would it really mean if we actually let students drive a little bit more? And if we actually 